Thank you so much, Renata. So the second panel of the day is officially starting. As Renata just said, the tech we want is built and maintained with care. Before we start, for those that might have joined a bit later, let me just share a few housekeeping notes. So this is a one hour panel. Um, basically, um, the speakers will do their, their, their interventions and we will uh, take 10 minutes towards the end to answer some questions. If questions already come to your mind, please share them in the chat and then we can share them during the Q&A. Uh, otherwise, as Renata just did, you can also like raise your hand and unmute yourself at the moment when we will have the Q&A. Uh, please keep your microphone muted unless you're requested to speak, um, so not to derange uh, the rest of the of the speakers. And also an important reminder is that the panel is in English, but there are automatic translations that are available here in Zoom. So um, you can follow the live subtitles in the language of your choice. I think that you have to select captions uh, somewhere on the top left. Um, Last but not least, the event follows the Open Knowledge Code of Conduct, and in a second, I will share a link in the chat as well. So we want to really have a healthy, respectful uh, conversation uh, with people with different backgrounds. So in case uh, you're not respecting the Code of Conduct, we reserve ourselves the um, right to uh, remove people if necessary. Um, and the session is broadcasted live on YouTube. Um, please, if you want to share anything, use the hashtag that we want. Um, and you can tag also us, Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, so that we can amplify your post. Uh, but enough of the housekeeping, and let's deep dive um, in uh, this session. So basically, in the past decades, we have been relying more and more on technology and software in almost every aspect of our lives. The more people use software, the more, sadly, we could argue, um, software gets built. And the more it's actually this software requires uh, a maintenance. A lot of the tech that we use today relies actually on open source code. And just like any physical infrastructure, like the road that you take every day uh, to go to work or the park where you take a stroll uh, on Sunday, uh, digital infrastructure also needs regular upkeep and maintenance. A big chunk of this work of maintenance is actually done by a restrained group of people. Sometimes it's volunteers, sometimes not. But the reality is that most of the times, those group of people are overwhelmed with work. And the other reality is also that these communities are not very highly visible. And their work is often taken for granted without thinking about the human capital that is actually need to make sure things keep on working. So in our capitalistic society, a lot of the spotlight is actually on innovation and you know the disruptive idea, the stroke of genius, and maintenance somehow does not seem to take a lot of attention. It is too ordinary to be paid attention to. Maybe it's not considered productive enough, but the truth is that digital technologies need people to care for them, to keep them alive. And we could argue that it's probably our shared responsibility also to ensure that the digital infrastructure we depend upon has the support that they need. Um, today, we we'll need to discuss this very, very important topic. I have three fantastic people. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce them before uh, leaving the floor to them. Uh, they'll have much more interesting stuff to say uh, than myself. So the first one is Katarina Meja, who is the director of Digital Infrastructure Insight Funds, um, which is a global initiative that focuses on how basically digital infrastructure is built and deployed. It provides a platform uh, and also funding. Uh, before that, Katarina was the head of research of the Prototype Fund, uh, which is a project from Open Knowledge Foundation Germany and the German Federal Ministry for Education and Research. And she's also an external expert uh, for the Sovereign Tech Fund, which is arguably one of the initiatives out there that started to shine a light actually on the very much needed work of maintenance. Um, together with Katarina, I also have Alison Pike, who's the co-founder of Infield, um, which is basically a company that simplifies the process of upgrading software dependencies. And it has a particular focus on open source software. Um, Infield basically helps developers track and handle software updates over time, and it ensures that projects remain up to date without disrupting functionalities. Alison actually also runs uh, the Substack newsletter once a maintainer, and that's actually how I got to know Alison, uh, because I think a month ago she interviewed uh, my ex-colleague Adrian Mercader about his work of maintaining uh, Seeken. Last but not least, uh, we have Matteo Giacomi, 
uh, who's a um, doctor of techno-anthropology and also assistant professor at the Alberg University, Tantlab and Mass Shine Center. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this correctly. Um, Mathieu, uh, Mathieu's research is focusing basically on the practices of user communities around open source tools in social sciences and humanities. Before joining uh, the Alberg University, he has been a research engineer at Media Lab, uh, the Sciences Po um, Media Lab Paris, and is also the co-founder of Giphy, uh, which is a popular open source network visualization tool. And um, Mathieu is here and actually he's the one that sort of like draw my attention to maintenance because uh, a year ago uh, in the FOSDEM Open Research Dev Room that we co-organized, he gave a very fantastic and moving talk about caring and maintaining Giphy. Um, so welcome all uh, in this panel. I'll maybe start settling a bit a bit um, the, the atmosphere by asking a very general question, which is, why do you think that the critical work of maintaining digital technology often goes unnoticed? And I would suggest maybe Alison can start and then Katarina and then Mathieu, and then we'll reverse the order later. Sure, hello everybody. Um, so as uh, Sarah said, uh, my name is Alison, I'm co-founder of a company called Infield that helps consumers, so companies essentially maintain their open source software. Um, and so on the consumer side, I would say in response to this question, that, you know, essentially maintenance doesn't get any engineers promoted. And that's the sad reality. Um, but in a corporate environment where engineering teams are under very strict deadlines to push new features, to add revenue, ultimately, you know, maintenance is seen as a cost center. And that's one of the um, real, real problems from the consumer side, because it's very difficult for the champion of maintenance, the person on the team who maybe has been burned before, who has seen either their own product, you know, kind of slowly decay, or they've had an emergency and they've had security issues or things like that. It can sometimes be hard to get the internal buy-in um, to dedicate specific time and to allocate resources to maintenance. So that's on the consumer side um, of open source software. On the maintainer side, um, and as Sarah said, I, you know, I've interviewed at this point dozens of open source maintainers. Um, I think that burnout is a real problem that isn't talked about enough. Um, you know, oftentimes maintainers get into uh, the work of open source uh, maintenance, you know, really from a place of love and care and genuine intellectual curiosity. And, you know, either there's a project that speaks to them personally for professional reasons, for personal reasons, or there's a project that, um, you know, maybe they created themselves and took off and become, you know, became very popular and, and uh, used, you know, globally. Those people often shoulder a huge responsibility um, that they never really imagined themselves signing up for. So, you know, they got into it with very good intentions. They genuinely love and care about what they do. But ultimately, the amount of work is just so much. And again, it's unpaid for the most part. Um, and so burnout is, is just a really big problem um, among the people that I speak with. And then that has kind of knock on effects throughout, you know, the culture and throughout the industry, um, because ultimately a lot of open source maintenance relies on communication between maintainers. Um, and if you're trying to contribute and you can't get a hold of somebody because they're burnt out and they're not working on it anymore, um, then that can be a really big problem. I'll stop there. Thanks, Hi, Alison. everybody. Yeah. Uh, very excited to be here. here as, uh, and I will second a lot of things that Alison just said. Um, while I'm now a research director, I was also a technology funder. And even before that, I worked as a researcher on implicit development environments of open source software for a really long time. And I learned some things along the way. And um, among them is that we should want to know more about the aspects of digital work summarized under maintenance, because despite the overemphasis that you mentioned on the new in building technology, we know from surveys these aspects actually, at least in code based developer work, 
takes up only um, to one one quarter of the time spent developing or deploying code. The product is never finished. Instead, once it ships to the to be used by others, a feedback loop starts, and the other seventy five percent of workload. Um, yeah, uh, what is happening to the maintenance, the regular upkeep, expansion, et cetera, of software, the public stories we tell about technologies. And I assume that the statistic would also come true for other technologies than open source software or technology deployments, strangely often end where the interaction with users only starts. Uh, I sometimes joke that, that these are the care aspects that seem also to be gendered in society to repair, nurture, negotiate functionalities, norms, governance, and so on. And especially in my area of expertise, software infrastructure, the duration of use um, of a given component can be quite extensive. And that's also something we need to think about more. Think software in aeronautics or some key scientific software applications that maybe Mathieu can speak about. For instance, for modeling of weather phenomenon, uh, phenomena, and there is no moving fast and breaking things. You have to keep the engine running and lights on in large scale systems, which requires specific knowledge, but also a specific identification with a role in the systems as their keeper. Hi, super happy to be here. Um, I I have this kind of double perspective of uh, having been kind of a maintainer myself, but also as a scholar, I just learned so much from a book that is only published in French yet, that is in English would be called The Care of Things. So I'm going to be kind of the voice of things that have been observed about maintenance in other settings, but that resonated with me. And one of the interesting words that the authors of that book, Denis and Ponty, uh, put on the question of maintenance is the fact that it doesn't make an event. So that's a big difference with repair that is very close to maintenance. But when you repair, you 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 bring back the maintained thing to the to the, to the status quo. You make it work again, and. The breaking of something, the breaking of a, an open source software, for instance, this happens to, to Gephi, one of the uh, tools I was carrying or taking care of, uh, made a lot of people unhappy because you know it's a pro it's an issue to them, and you you come and you can kind of fix it, and that makes your work visible. So repair is visible because it makes an event, but maintenance uh, aims to prevent the breaking, so it's never an event. And because it's not an event, it's not visible. So there is something that is really interesting to the to the to the nature of maintenance. And I think that this is really a, a hard question. Why, like, should we? I think th th there's kind of a dilemma in here: is should we make maintenance visible and how, uh, or is it something we should keep kind of invisible? I think that, well. Everything has been said about the 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 fact that maintenance um, it, the the main issue of maintenance is the fact that it is in, invisible. So yeah, I'd love I'm to know here. Matthew your your thoughts on um, risk because something that I think relates to what you're saying is that you know oftentimes <laughs> repair comes as a reaction to a problem with the software, it's no longer working, there's a security vulnerability, et cetera. Um, maintenance by an outside kind of observer or a consumer might seem to be low risk or no risk. But I think from the maintainer's perspective or from an engineer's perspective who's tasked with upgrading, for example, um, they know that that's not true. There's always an inherent risk when you're upgrading something that it could break. So on top of the invisibility of the work, the lack of you know a potential promotion, <laughs> that kind of thing, you have the fact that there's downside. So you know why should I, as an engineer, who's kind of a mid-level engineer on my engineering team, why should I take on the task of maintenance if not only am I not gonna get promoted, but potentially I could bring down production? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, okay, that's a really great question. <laughs> um, but I, I think we, we need to make the distinction between two things. So first, there's the, the personal risk of taking the, the burden of maintenance upon you. 
Um, so yes, there is a personal risk, and but I'm going to not talk about that first. I think that the more um, important thing is the the. So I'm going to call that the ontological share of maintenance. I'm all still following Denis and Ponty on that, um, and I am I am a little bit thinking out loud here because those ideas kind of came as I was preparing for this panel kind of just right away. I think that, so let me say some, something first. As you said, there is a risk in maintenance, but it's, it's even more than that. It's not just that you may break the thing while maintaining it. It's it's that it's two other things. It's the fact that you may to have to change the thing when you maintain it. And it's not necessarily downside, it might be upside. Uh, so maintenance may uh, impose a change, but also maintenance might be an opportunity for change. So in a way, I want to say it's not risk, it's also opportunities, right? I want to see opportunity as kind of a positive risk. I want to show the upside. And I also want to say then it's not a, it's not low risk on, or seen as low risk. It's more like slow risk or slow opportunity. The, I want to come back to this idea that it's really the lack of event that is the core issue here, because if you take a longer time scale, you would see that maintenance changes the thing. Um, I don't know, a kind of super mundane basic ideas I have is like the game No Man's Sky, which was like a framed as a catastrophe, cat, cat, like, an industrial catastrophe when it was um, published first, disappointing everyone, buggy as hell and so on. And then slowly at low, at low volume, it became kind of a hit. But the moment it became a hit was never an event. It happened so slowly. And that thing, I think that's one of the examples in the popular culture where we can see how a very slow change can happen and yet it doesn't make an event, so we don't see it. We can only realize it's there after, like if, if it ends up being an, a good story. And maybe that's a model that can work for maintenance. Maybe there, there is a way to have narratives about maintenance that show the positive opportunities that were taken during maintenance. But of course, this can only happen kind of after the fact. And the flip side of that is what you mentioned, which is you can also change the thing for the worst while you maintain it, or you, you may even do it intentionally. And I'm just thinking here uh, about ungentification typically, and I'm going to stop here, but I could elaborate on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, this directly leads to my second question. It's very interesting what you all shared. Um, I think this idea of like a labor of love that is there for care, but it's a love that is not actually seen. It's very slow. It doesn't make an event. Um, so I was wondering um, if you can maybe share some ideas of how we can um, better value and support this essential work of, uh, of maintenance. And Matthew, I'll start with you and then I'll We'll go with Katharina and then Alison. Then I, I will just, uh, so I asked one of the authors of the book I'm kind of talking about here, what he thinks, I asked the same question basically. And he told me that um, I should be um, critical of heroic narratives. And this, this idea grew on me because I thought maybe what you could do is, as you know, from the standpoint of an engineer, I almost, I'm trained as an engineer. I could just let my tool break uh, and then come as a hero to fix it. And th that's certainly a viable strategy. But then it's true that if you do that, then it means that maintenance has to always be heroic. Maintenance has to always be, you know, this artificial event, or I don't know exactly how to say that. It's, n it's not how maintenance really is. And I think that there is a virtue to trying to value maintenance for what it actually is. Um, labor of love or possibly of hate because I think that there could be an adversarial way of maintaining from big companies who unchitify their products but for us it would be mostly a labor of love it's slow it's low volume so how do you value that and make that visible the only kind of idea I have is we could just um, create events around maintenance that would just accept that they are just an event by convention because we decide it's an event but there is no breaking there is nothing that it doesn't come from the outside it's just a kind of a public relations trick to make maintenance visible 
maybe it could be enough. I just think that many things the engineers do actually already look like that, like uh, bug bashes or other things. Maybe there is some way to publicize these moments as moments of maintenance um, that cannot exist otherwise. Um, the answer I'm going to give is, of course, informed by my program and has to do with quantification and mapping, but needs to be handled with care, in my opinion. Um, I also see no need to make maintenance heroic, but now that we saw a string of events and examples iterating different aspects of amplified consequences once infrastructure breaks, for instance, with log4j or heartbeat bugs um, or all the um, bugs that have been happening over the last 10 years, at least with measure, there could be more knowledge commissioned, produced and updated and woven into realistic narratives about what being a worker in the digital realm means, means today um, or running technologies, what implications it has to have volunteer communities and enterprises co-produce specific economic goods digital and converge digital project, products that are informed by specific norms and then exposed to the market. What it means to introduce quantification and compliance into these ecosystems, because there's a lot of policy regulation on its way that targets volunteer um, communities like the ones we talked about. Professionalization and management theories are also an aspect of this and where ideology and or paradigms might produce challenges going forward. All in a living system, uh, I want to remind you of that continues to scale, shed skin and tends to have a different uh, meaning, risks and exploitation points for every stakeholder, group or observer. And especially to demonstrate that in the software engineering that we investigate and try to describe, um, at least in the course of my research fund, that bridges practitioners, academy, and deployers of safe technologies, that these are environments where the social aspects and people are key, plus a number of other virtual resources, virtues, and currencies that are very hard to grasp and um, to quantify and how to influence or change even with money, even more so in a time frame um, that the uninformed public would deem acceptable. And that is also something where the narratives need to work alongside um, the resourcification of a subsystem. We also have to ask ourselves what dimensions come into play if we discuss large scale technology systems plus the communities connected with them. There's a lot of good work that has been happening in academia for the last few years, but in my experience, practitioners and acad academy are quite disconnected. There's no research transfer, at least not the right formats to design this in a way that is respectful for both stakeholder groups. And uh, we're trying to counter that with it. I tend to agree with Matthew um, that exposure is a big part of this, making the kind of unseen work seen. Um, and that was really one of the leading motivations of starting the Substack once a maintainer was to start telling more of these stories of the people behind open source maintenance. Um, you know, I think some people find the actual code changes potentially interesting. And I think other people find the human stories potentially more interesting. Um, and we need to experiment. We need to figure out how to make this work um, more visible. I also think um, Matthew's point about the kind of slow, continuous maintenance, um, making really reframing that as valuable, um, is a really important piece of this. One of the people that I interviewed somewhat recently described um, why they went into open source as really, you know, when you think about gardening, for example, loving the weeding that, you know, people who get into gardening, a lot of times you might think, oh, I'm going to plant some flowers, I'm going to plant some pretty bushes. Um, but the real work of gardening is going out every single day and weeding and finding a sort of peace in that and finding satisfaction just in that, not in necessarily only seeing the beautiful flowers. And um, I just thought that was such a wonderful metaphor and really described how so many of the maintainers that I've interviewed really feel about it, which is that they feel like they're, they're truly doing valuable work. And the point at which they do burn out 
is when they don't feel like they're doing valuable work anymore. And what is that turning point, I think, is where we need to um, really focus. So, you know, if we bring more stories like this to light and we really emphasize that this is, you know, kind of beautiful work and that it's really important, um, then I think we can really make a difference in how people view this, both within organizations and kind of as a whole. Um, the last thing I'll say is that there is a place for everybody in o open source maintenance. So I get asked the question a lot, um, I want to be involved in open source I want to be a maintainer, but I don't know where to get started. I don't know how, um, you know, potentially I feel left out of the community. It's very intimidating to some people, especially to junior developers. Um, and I think there should be more emphasis on the breadth of projects that are out there, the variety of projects that are out there, um, and the different ways to get involved. So maintenance and care it might mean, you know, upgrading. It might also mean working on documentation. It might mean looking for um, bugs. It might mean, you know, depending on what your strengths are and depending on what your interests are, there really is a way for everybody, including completely non-technical people, um, to get involved in open source maintenance. And I don't think that there's um, enough said about that. Um, there tends to be a lot of focus on um, kind of the maverick who comes in and fixes everything um, and the creators of the projects, which, you know, they should obviously be due the respect for creating the project. Um, but there's not as much emphasis on, you know, someone who said, I'm going to spend three days just reading through your documentation and making updates so it's a little more clear to the community. Um, and that's really valuable, too. Thank you. And thanks, Alison, for bringing up like documentation and all the non-technical work that also goes um, with it. Um, I'm especially noticing that your uh, comparison with gardening is having a lot of success in the chat. <laughs> so we'll probably go over that uh, as Great. well later. Um, Brian Housel is the name of the guy who who said that originally. So I'll, I'll give him the credit for that. So I hear a lot of things that you shared uh, about, for example, uh, bug crushing events as a way to sort of like make the invisible visible. Um, I hear also about maybe communicating about it. Alison, you run a, a newsletter, uh, the Substack Samantha, so that's maybe a way uh, to make it visible. I also think that a lot um, actually goes with funding. So something that really struck me was what Katarina also mentioned before, uh, that one quarter of the time of developer time is actually devoted to maintenance. And I suspect that it's probably the same, if not even even less with funding. Katarina, you wanted to add something? The other way around, like the, the actual coding is one quarter and all the other stuff, including the non-technical work is 75%. Yeah, thanks. Um, but so yeah, my intuition is also that a lot of funding out there, I mean, and for that, something like the Sovereign Tech Fund is really kind of like changing a little bit the narrative is, not devoted to maintenance, but more about developing new things and adding some new innovative things. Um, so my question for you, and maybe we can start with you, Katarina, because I suspect you also have uh, a lot of experience with um, the uh, the digital infrastructure inside funds, uh, would be um, how do you have some examples that you can maybe share uh, about um, effective maintenance strategies, for example, and if you have some intuition about why they're successful? Um, I think first of all, I'd like to say that there's a cascade of um, knowledge that has been created on the way of being a, a funder for open source innovation for a time. And then because we found out that uh, when people want to deploy open source components, they're often in a state of uh, bad maintenance, but not because of the fault of the people who are the maintainers, but because capitalism do, I will um, talk about that a, a bit later. And then informed by this knowledge, uh, the Sovereign Tech Fund has been created, informed by what the Sovereign Tech Fund can't do, the DIF uh, comes into play. So uh, everything I'm saying is mostly informed by my experience from being a technology and research funder. And as a technology funder, of course, you can spend X amount of money one time on a specific service because uh, often that's what the rules are at least for public spending and you have to find innovative ways to make these kinds of fundings work for maintainers and uh, communities 
And then you can hope that the money you invested has a multiplier effect in research funding in opposite to that. And the interesting part for me is that the IF also funds implementation experiments, small scale, but still uh, you are in a position that you can try to have the researchers derive guiding principles that might benefit many projects and maintainers from a given subsystem in addressing mutual challenges, plus there are different standards and documentation. Knowledge can be as easily distributed as code, copy and paste it. Um, but you have to have a contextual awareness, of course, because not every insight applies to every subsystem. Uh, I have multiple examples um, and they can all be found on our website. I will post it in the chat. It's Infrastructure Insights Fund from my cohort since 2017 um, that attempted, for instance, to model indicators of how to predict where challenges might emerge, social or technological, um, from exit to community calculators, uh, to theorizing and depicting underproduction and connected to longevity, how to replace critical components once they became orphaned. Um, this has to do with the composting we just discussed in the chat uh, or even with lead time to detect which components might become unmaintained and to find suitable replacements instead of forcing responsibility for critical components on volunteers against their wishes because some people might choose to not be responsible for what they introduce to the world. These projects don't want to point fingers, uh, it's important to say, but to inform whether resources that are now starting to become available from different sources, be it public funding, or other sources should be directed towards. And I think this might be especially helpful to be proactive because we learned that uh, when someone is drowning, figuratively speaking, he is not vocal. Um, so it is best if they don't have to call for help. The projects that are already in a stressful situation are under-maintained, under-resourced, um, but we pay attention to what's going on. This is also why instruments like the Sovereign Tech Fund, for instance, have pull mechanisms instead of just open calls where people have to apply actively. And what gives me hope is that science can be a vessel in this way. But since we are investigating a living system, it's important to not be exploitative also in research undertakings. For like, Even if you ask um, for interview time with maintainers, often um, they are so under stress with their, with their daily tasks that this is a lot to ask and um, it is good to understand a little bit how about the rationals and um, logics, how the system is structured before you make requests like that. That is also something that was a good learning along the way. Thanks, Katarina. Um, Alison or Mathieu, I leave you the choice to decide who goes next. I can take it. Um, I think that um so in, it, personally i have never had a i, ne, I, I never i was never successful in funding uh, my own tool with a big uh, funding body i hope it happens in the future but i so i know and i also hear um that in other contexts it exists unfortunately that's good so, so i don't know much about that but i i think i understand that Whoever wants to fund um, open source software understands that um, a lot of the tool design, a lot of the software design happens during maintenance. So that's kind of the power you have by funding maintenance is the power of design, except in kind of an in a slow regime. So it's really nice that some people in big funding agencies, in companies, in different places have money and have this understanding. So they are kind of allies of the maintainer. Um, but in the that's still kind of a niche. And I don't want to kind of convert the entire world to that. But I just want to acknowledge that a lot of the issues around funding maintenance have to do with the 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 power play around maintenance because in, for instance in a setting where so aside from those allies because maintenance is operations that's first of all there's that's not something you want to fund if you're a funding body you want to give money once and then you're the hero you don't want to be the one giving money ongoing in an ongoing way because if, if you do that you're the good guy still only one time but also when you stop the funding, then the, then you're the, the bad guy. And 
so the kind of power the, yeah funding agencies would not like to fund operations they would like to fund projects one shots but it even goes uh, beyond that because from the standpoint of the maintainer if it's like you have created, say, your own software, or you have reappropriated another piece of software. You're the maintainer. Maybe it it has some medium-sized public. It's not, you know. So you feel entitled. You you think, and your users tell you, "Why well, this should be maintained?" But really, what would gain, kind of a cynical actor who could fund you in this, if they are not an ally? They there is kind of an obvious way where the that they would have no power by funding you. And I think that um so for instance, in academia, the way you would get a grant for a, some research work has kind of clear counterparts, like the transactional side of that is clear. And the maintaining a science tool, open source science tool, just doesn't fit in this kind of transactions. And that's kind of. I think this is an unfixable problem. I just think that the right way is to just have allies. So, um, the the value must come from uh, raising awareness among funders of the benefit they could have by funding something as slow as maintenance. I have no hope to convert uh, cynical actors to 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 fund maintenance. I agree. Um, I think that ultimately if funding is coming from the consumer side of open source, then we should look to what's been successful in terms of relationships between consumers and open source maintainers. And ultimately the consumers, so let's take a corporate um, entity that, how do they view maintenance within their organization first, before we even think about them funding an open source project? How do they think about maintaining their own product, commercial product, right? And what I've seen work well and what I have seen be successful is um, essentially maintenance rotations where the engineering organization will mandate that call it once a week, every Friday, we're going to rotate who is responsible for working on maintenance. And you are taking that day to work on maintenance, you're not doing anything else. Um, and those kinds of rot rotations have worked really well because it gives the engineer the freedom to not worry about meetings, not worry about deadlines, uh, pushing a feature. They know that they're given that time and space to work on that. Um, and ultimately that comes from the top, right? That's modeled by the VP of engineering, that's modeled by the CTO, um, that's potentially modeled by the founder of the company. And that means that those people have demonstrated that they value maintenance and that they value uh, the tools that they're using, the open source software that they're using. I think once an organization has that culture in place, as a consumer, then those companies are the ones that tend to also give back to the community. So Shopify, for example, is kind of my go-to here. Shopify and Ruby on Rails has a really tight relationship with each other. Um, Shopify has a whole team of people whose sole job it is to basically maintain Rails, which is a giant open source project. So they've built a community around it. They've built um, you know, a culture around this open source project that they didn't create. Um, and contrasting that with, you know, something like the JavaScript ecosystem, where there are tons and tons of projects out there that have, you know, one creator, one person maintaining it, and it's lost in a sea, you know, of thousands and thousands and thousands of packages. Um, there's no consumer support. Um, and it creates actually this negative feedback loop where in an ecosystem like that, not to hate on JavaScript here, but I'm going to, um, in an ecosystem like that, um, the consumers get very frustrated, right? Because they say that main maintenance is really difficult for them um, because there's dependency sprawl and there's not enough, you know, uh, actually maintaining their project from a consumer perspective um, is really difficult. So in a way, the kind of structure of the open source ecosystem can either lend itself to 
what I would call a good maintenance culture, or it could lend itself to a really difficult maintenance culture. Um, Python is an interesting one because there are so many academia driven projects. Um, and so, you know, the culture of academia, as Matthew mentioned, really kind of informs a lot of the Python ecosystem. Um, and so that's kind of its own separate thing. Um, and so I, I do think we kind of need to look like ecosystem by ecosystem and think about what works well for this ecosystem. It's not a one size fits all solution. Thank you. And what you're describing, Alison, is what sometimes, I, I mean, it completely linked to the tragedy of the commons in a way. Uh, I love the concept of the dependencies proliferation or dependencies pro. I didn't know that word in English, so I'm learning a new thing here. Um, I had a lot of the stuff that you were saying about also like being under-resourced and uh, the idea of like also like paying some time attention to a project before it starts throwing, uh, as Katarina was was mentioning before. Um, maybe one last thing that I wanted to ask you, and it's also linked to something that was mentioned in the chat, which is, um, you know, uh, again, with the metaphor of gardening, and someone mentioned, how can you uh, compost software? And also, so, um, right, Lightfully, Katarina mentioned responsible sunsetting, which made me think actually of a situation that we counted at the Open Knowledge Foundation just a week ago, in which one of our projects was using an open source library. I mean, it's not a very common thing. And actually, uh, that our technique, Patricio, wrote a blog about this. Uh, but from one day to the other, this library just disappeared. The documentation was not there anymore. So um, also linked to this idea of like, the labor of love and all the exhaustion and stress that comes from it. I maybe wanted as the last question and also to link to the panel that will come just after hours. Um, I wanted maybe to take some time to reflect a little bit about the ethical implications, but also maybe the environmental implication, the in general sustainability as a broader term uh, implications of not investing in the proper care of digital infrastructure. And I'll maybe let uh, Katarina start. Um, yeah, happy. I'm not sure if I can draft the environmental consequence, consequences directly, but in the wider sense of theories about physical and other comments uh, that are known to me, and also the discontents of governing them or their conceptual mismatches, uh, like the free rider problem, it becomes clear that we are in the middle of a conflict between societal and economic systems currently. Um, I'm going to say the bad C word here. I already told before the modulation of capitalism we have right now is, in my opinion, not serving the majority of people on the planet nor our environment. So it's time to come up with the legal process and technological tools to not exhaust the means of life or production and to unconcentrate them, ensuring that input and output are more balanced, more people have a say in the terms of trade-offs. Because in the example I named earlier, the team or person, and we heard about this a lot today, uh, who is a core developer or contributor of a project that by, might not be commercial for him, might end up in a position in a market where he bears the brunt of responsibility for upkeeping the functionality and reliability alone, while surpluses are socialized and part of the income of enterprises often. And this is also important to discuss in all of the efforts to make open source applications default for digital sovereignty or other purposes. While I think there are good intentions, uh, there needs to be enough resources factored in to also support the projects upstream because everything is modular and the tech you run and you can use directly is only the always the tip of the iceberg of the entire stack. Otherwise, the good intentions will backfire, in my opinion. Um, we don't have to go into details of the different meanings of free and open and back to the 80s in a way um, where research on this um, subsystem started in economy, in law, and in standards to see that different concepts and perceptions of the world and how it could and should function have encounters in this space. And that is why I also think the research produced in the space is, is relevant uh, beyond open source um, because commons is a concept that is very valid in restructuring society going forward and uh, I think there's a lot of potential there. 
I'll speak up next because I don't want to be to have the last word, the last word. I will leave that to a woman. Uh, I don't like to to talk about ethics as if we didn't talk about ethics already. It's not a separate question. It's interesting to everything we've said. And my angle on that will be to go back to care because we've talked so much about maintenance and not that much about care. I'm just going to go back to the metaphor of, of gardening, but just from a different angle. Um, so my, my field is STS, science and technology studies. And the, the main figure about that is Anne-Marie Moll. Maybe you know about her. So she says that care is attention to um, relations and needs, right? So that's the same idea that the way you care for your garden is about the relations between you and the plants, but also the plants themselves, the climate, like the sun and everything. It comes uh, in the studies by Anne-Marie Moll about her observations in hospitals, right? Obviously. Uh, and kind of, you can think of it as the difference between a nurse and a, and a surgeon or a doctor, but like a surgeon. And the question is like, who is really healing the people? Is, is it just the, the, the surgeon or is it also the nurses? Obviously, what Anne-Marie Moll is trying to do is to make the work of the nurses visible. That's why care, in her perspective, has been so influential to the maintenance and repair studies and that we can bring back the same kind of ideas that are easy to understand in the world of of uh, software maintenance because and and i have to say this has not been done uh, the way we the the scholars write about maintenance for software is not like that uh, maintenance and repair studies are really for material things and then computer science has very different takes so what i'm saying here is kind of kind of new and i didn't invent it but like there, you will not find a lot of literature about that and basically um, the, the, the surgeon is the hero who comes and reverts to the status quo, while the nurse is the one who understands that for, for the patient to get better, it sometimes it's not even about uh, having the organ work again if it destroys the rest of your life. What about the quality of life? What about the time you have left? And, you know, that's also, Anne Marie Moll wanted to make that visible. The, the same happens for the software. Because if we think of the, the, I'm taking a word from Alison here, the champion of maintenance. So maintainers have their champions. But if the champion is like a surgeon, like the expert coder who comes and fixes the code and then it works again, then we're missing that maintenance is at its heart attention to fragility and a lot of things that are not just the code, but everything around it. Because, you know, care is not just um, caring of, it's also taking care of, not caring for, but taking care of. And the people who do operate that care are not necessarily coders. They might be the people who write the documentation, publicize the tools, write tutorials. They are part of the community. There are many people, many of which are not coders. And they are also, as a maintainer myself, but not really a coder. And I don't, I'm not the one who goes the most on Giphy, for instance. Um, I know we, we need antennas. We need people who use the tool, give feedback, say what's wrong, give an orientation have a sense of which libraries are, might be breaking. There's a lot of things going on that are not just coding. And those are a more a broader attention to what's going on in maintenance, a broader attention to the relations between the, the maintained software and everything around it, including users, community, documentation, tutorials, uh, and many other things, teachings, whatever you want. So those are also, they should be part of the maintenance. I'll try to tie what the example that Sarah gave at the very beginning um, of this question back to what Matthew just said, because I think they actually relate to each other. So if I leave my garden unmaintained, if I don't do the work of weeding, if I don't keep my yard, you know, looking nice, who's going to notice that? Potentially my very close neighbors, the people who live right next to me might notice, oh, my garden's, you know, oh, Allison's garden's getting kind of messy. And eventually the worse it gets the more people notice right like the crazier my yard gets the more overgrown it gets the farther away someone might notice like there's something going on in that garden um and i think that is also true of open source in the sense that sarah you mentioned that you realized at uh open knowledge foundation that a project that you were using a package that you were using was no longer maintained um but you know that could potentially be a very small number of consumers who noticed that a 
project is not being maintained. It just so happens that you are part of the population that uses that project. So how do we give more visibility into abandoned projects, essentially, is what I'm saying. It's very important. Um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time on in the when I wear my infield hat is how do we let people know what packages are abandoned, what packages are stale, maybe they haven't been touched in more than a year or two. What are kind of the like red flashing warning signs that say, hey, someone might want to take a look at this garden because it's starting to look like a little wonky. Um, and that I think is something that people don't, you know, really focus on, um, which is like how many eyeballs are on this project such that there's going to be a threshold where the community realizes that they need to step up. Um, you know, ultimately, again, a lot of that falls on the creator of the project or the core maintainer of the project to proactively let people know that they're struggling with maintenance, that they're, or, you know, they're moving on in their career and they are going to do something else right now. So, you know, that to me is backwards. It shouldn't be on the the creator of the project or the maintainer of the project to say, hey, I really need to line someone up to take this over after me. Will someone please step in and help me? Um, it should be that the community says, hey, you've been doing this for a really long time. <laughs> How can we help and take this over from you so that you don't need to do this anymore? Um, and so I'd love to get to the point that we can kind of switch the burden of responsibility from the kind of originator side over to the consumer side. Um, and again, that comes back to what will encourage people to truly um, be curious about and contribute to open source software and make them feel you know, responsible for it and make them feel like they should contribute to the community. They should tend not only their own garden, but also you know, their, their neighbor's garden as well. Thank you very much. I love the fact that we really concentrated on care and the, uh, the work of love. Uh, I want to open maybe the panel uh, up a little bit and see if anyone in the public, in the audience has uh, one question that they would like to ask. You can just raise your hand or write the question in the chat if you want. Okay, we have one from Tuka. I don't know if you want to speak aloud or shall I read the question for you? Okay, go ahead and read. So do the infrastructure projects properly consider the maintenance burden that their ch changes place on other projects that depend on them? Further, you might want to invest more in the infrastructure projects for them to keep better compatibility and lighten the burden on you. I'll just speak quickly to the compatibility point. Um, so, you know, I do think one solution to the problem, <laughs> right, is to make a project that is, you know, essentially backwards compatible forever. <laughs> and so every time you release a new version of your project, you make sure that no one has to upgrade, um, that, you know, you've kind of made your project infinitely compatible. Ultimately, you know, in practice, obviously, that's really difficult to do and almost no one does it. Um, but you do see on the commercial open source side that that's more common. Um, and so again, you know, we can think about that. Why is that, right? Oh, potentially it's related to a financial interest. Um, these big corporations obviously have a huge incentive to let their customers keep using, you know, a version of Oracle that's, you know, 20 years old because a bank is relying on it. So what is the equivalent in open source software? Um, so I do think that in kind of the free open source side of things, um, they potentially don't, to answer the question directly, they don't consider the maintenance burden, I think, as much as they do on the commercial open source side. Um, but I, I think there are 
good reasons for that also in the sense that they're pushing their project forward. And there's there's always this um, tension and balance between how do I make my project, you know, backwards compatible, uh, keep it secure for a long time, ease the burden on the community, um, while also pushing the project forward and, and keeping it relevant. Because if you don't push the project forward, if you don't respond to issues, if you don't release new features, then people are going to stop using it. And then you get into the negative feedback loop of potentially it becomes abandoned. And then the community is back in that same, you know, bad place that we don't want the community to be. I can speak to the question of infrastructure. And I want to clarify something is that you don't, you never create an infrastructure, you just become an infrastructure. The reason being that infrastructure, the, the difference between a tool and, in, and an infrastructure is whether it blends into the background and that's relative to, relative to you. The same thing can be an infrastructure to someone and a tool to someone else. Example, when Linus Torvalds invented Linux, he didn't think of it as an infrastructure at all. And then you would obviously say that this is an infrastructure, but it started as kind of a, a thing on its own, an experiment, right? In science, this is so all of the time, all the time. You create an experiment and then someone reuses it, it circulates, and then you have users and suddenly someone depends on you and you didn't expect that. So I want to clarify that from the standpoint of the maintainer, um, you don't realize that you are a maintainer until it's kind of too late, like you're just the, that guy who's doing their own thing on GitHub. And then suddenly someone is like, hey, I need I need you to fix that shit. And then, it, you know, really, it may come to you as a surprise. So that's why um, historically in open source software, you, you would not think of your thing as an infrastructure unless you have a good reason to. While I would, you know playing into what Alison says, for a company, the company is self-aware that it is by itself an infrastructure. That's what it tries to be. So then, of course, it's, a, it's of use in that setting. Uh, I don't know if, Katarina, you wanted to add something. Otherwise, we have a very interesting comment from the chat, but I'll go after that. No, no, I just added one sentence about the licenses. They were designed in a way that you can't control the proliferation, but I think they were created in a time that didn't foresee the scale of the entire internet and the amount of users it's going to have and the amount of innovation that are based on in infrastructure. And so um, I think it's time to renegotiate. Thank you. Um, so someone is asking on YouTube, basically, they're saying that what is missing in the conversation from their perspective is the focus on purpose. So if purpose is serving the community, then the community will continue to support um, the, the technology, the software. But the problem is that now all purpose is commercial. We don't have a lot of time to answer this very big question, but in case anyone wants to quickly go on it. Mm, I don't think purpose is all commercial. There are different governance models that can support um, non-market economies and projects in a way that are explored around the globe, like for instance, open source collectives or something like that, um, that are starting to rise and uh, might be able to support some of the projects that are infrastructure. Um, but I don't think it's true that just because you have a useful tool or a useful component, you will always find um, users that are also able to give back other than time. And uh, we saw that um, like in the last 20 years, if that would be the case, just because something is good, they will always be rewarded for their work. Um, then we would even live in a different world, but we don't. I totally agree. I think, you know, there are some open source projects that set out to be commercial open source projects. And sometimes those are the very well known, you know, kind of VC funded Silicon Valley backed open source projects that get a lot of visibility potentially compared to the other open source projects out there. But um, I agree with Katerina that um, there are many, many, many open source projects out there whose primary purpose is not to be commercial. Um, but I also agree with Matthew that, um, you know, many people who create open source projects do not foresee and cannot foresee, you know, their adoption. And that's just part of the nature of open source software. Um, many people are putting something out there purely for the purpose of, experimentation, you know, love, 
wanting to try something, may, wanting to learn something potentially, because working on open source software is a great way to learn and become a better developer. Um, and, you know, ultimately, if that work is unpaid, then it's a privilege to do that. And they don't know whether anybody's going to use it. And they might not necessarily be the greatest marketer in the world. And their package might sit there, you know, totally unused for 10 years and then for some reason, you know, get adopted um, later. Um, and so we just can't predict the dynamics of how these things will play out. Thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time, but I wanted, first of all, to thank Alison, Katarina and Mathieu for joining me today. Uh, it has been a very interesting discussion. I maybe just want to give you the opportunity super quickly in like 10 seconds if there's a last thought that you want to share. Uh, and then we'll just uh, go over to the next panel. Maybe just sorry, just one aspect. It is never the technological issues that uh, bring systems down. It is more the more complicated social questions. And so we should put attention and resources toward those. If you know an open source maintainer, tell them thank you. That goes a long way. Nothing to add. Thank you. Then, Mathieu, Katarina, Alison, thanks again. Uh, and yes, let's move on to the next panel.